hypnotism in my soul. Yo, man, nigga got that motherfucking fed look, man. That nigga got that fed look, man. I got that fed look. Live TV. Y'all come on in, man. What up? What up, y'all? Y'all want some game tonight? <clears throat> Yo, this is the podcast with Soul. Hit that like button, man. When you come in, please hit the like button. Thank you. Thank you for hitting that like button. Uh, we live. Got the man in the building. Freeway Rick Ross. Sean G. We chilling. It's late. I wanted to drop some game on y'all. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I uh, it don't get no better than this. Um, y'all see the man who it is. You see the sweatshirt. This is the real Rick Ross. This ain't the other dude. This the real one. We in Philly. Good dude right here. Been grinding all weekend. Heading back to Cali. When you going tomorrow? I'm gonna leave tomorrow after uh Nafia. We got Nafia sparring tomorrow, so I'm gonna go go check him out, see him spar my holler at the coach. You know, we got what a new that? coach. Man, shout out shout out to Nafia Charles, man. Shout out to Nafia. Yeah, y'all go check him out. You know what I'm saying? He on YouTube too. We got some fights on YouTube. Yo, share this live, man. Hit that like button and share this live. Share the link. Um Yo, you know a lot of the stuff I talk about on my channel is um entrepreneurial related, business related, and um, you know, the man I got sitting right here to my left, he gets a lot of coverage and notoriety for a former life uh, that he led, and that's fine, but nobody seems to focus on the even in that life nobody seems to focus on the mindset right and the business skills that it took to handle that kind of money right and logistically manage that many people and from a memory standpoint Keep appointments, make appointments. I always talk about establishing relationships, even with this YouTube thing, you understand? And that's one of the reasons why I'm here now in this hotel room in Philadelphia with this man right here. It's about establishing relationships, man. Real talk, real talk. You know. And you did that. We yeah. did that about four years ago when, when I came to New Jersey to speak. And, uh, Down in Trenton. And he made a point to, to, to let me know that he was there. I found and, you. I reached out to you. On, I re, see, and I talk about that to y'all too, man. You got to take risks and reach out to people. I reached out to this man on Facebook. I saw the flyer on his Facebook. I hit him on the DM. The nigga hit me back. It might have been an hour or two. I said, Rick, you going to be in Trenton such and such a day? I'm going to be there. I said, yo, I'm going to come down and meet you. I did some fed time too. Uh, he said, I'll be there. We exchanged. I went, met him there, and, you bought know. Bought some books. Bought some books, bought the hoodie. <laughs> yeah, he made, he, made, he, he made sure that that I recognized him, that, that, that he stood out. Out of everybody at that crowd, one of the things that I really liked about what Sean did is he made himself stand out from the crowd. He wasn't just a, 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 a spoke in the wheel. You know how you got a wheel and you got a thousand spokes in it. Well, he wasn't just a spoke in the wheel. He made himself the hub. He made sure that I recognized him and that when I come on the East Coast, he is one of the people that, that I network with. I mean, we network all the time, but... If I'm over on this end, me and him are talking, you know, and I'm letting him know what I'm doing. He let me know what he's doing. So, so 
that's a form of, of, of networking of, of getting entrepreneurship. Them. Yeah, absolutely. And when I came out to um when I came out to LA to do the collab with Moses, we hooked up, you got the hotel room for me at the Marriott out of LAX with your with, with your car. But getting back though, you know, the thing is you, you gotta establish relationships with people, man. Because good people. Try to get good people. And and all the time you're not gonna get good people. Sometimes you're going to get some fucked up motherfuckers, you know, like, I don't run into some fucked up motherfuckers. We were just talking about a fucked up motherfucker just a minute ago. John Singleton is a fucked up motherfucker. I don't care if he dead or not. Y'all, y'all have sympathy on the dead. I don't give a fuck. You fucked up dead when you dead. You fucked up when you was alive. You was fucked up. He was just a fucked up dude, you know. What'd he do, Rick? He stole my shit, you know what I'm saying? We, we were working together. Uh, I thought he was a friend. And the motherfucker took my story and sold it, you know, without without me being a part of it. Uh, and, and I just thought that was fucked up that he would do that, uh, knowing the situation that I was in. You know, I was hurting for cash, uh, um, didn't have nowhere to stay, you know. Uh, uh, he from South Central? You from South Central? That's why I thought it was going to be so cool. I'm, I'm like, this is my little homie, you know. I, I knew he had looked up to me. You know, I knew he looked up to me. No way you came up in South Central LA and you find out about my story and you don't look up to me. And then somebody showed me on his on his Instagram page, you know, me and him take a picture. You know, we taking a picture with the book and he talking about uh, Rick Ross, great story, uh, snowfall coming soon. You know, I'm like, what the fuck? So this motherfucker had planned all the time. When we took that picture, he had already planned on doing a movie or TV series without me. So... Establishing relationships because you never know. Hit that like button, y'all. You never know where somebody is going to end up, you know. And just because somebody is in a position on Monday, that don't mean they're going to be in the same position next Thursday. What a difference a day makes, man. But an hour. Getting back to, you know, my original point with this man is the mind, man. I, I saw it, you know, me being an entrepreneur and having made a million dollar net worth before and knowing all that comes with that, the phone calls, the, the people tugging at you, you're taking care of people, you're doing your personal, not just your business, but then your personal life. So I, I saw the mindset behind this guy and, and, and what it takes, man. And uh, I'm glad I'm able to get him to, you know, to come on my podcast, man. And and, and we're going to talk about some entrepreneurship things, man. You're working on, uh, you got your you got your cannabis license out in, in Cali, right? You already know it. You got a book? Two books. Going on three. I'm working on another one right now. What about your, what about your streaming, your streaming joint? I'm working on a new streaming channel where it's going to be a channel. Um, we're going to be streaming fights. I'm going to have movies. You know, bullshit movies that, that you can't see nowhere else because nobody else will playing because they so fucked up. Probably be mostly like black directors, black producers who really ain't got the money to do the shit and they go out and half-ass do it and, you know, don't get it right. But I'm going to get those people a place that they can take their material. Because, you know, YouTube used to be like that. Yeah. You know, YouTube used to be a place where, you know, most of the shit on there was bullshit. But eventually, they started putting it together. Yeah. So I'm going to start off like YouTube did. You know, because so often what I find out about us is that if we can't start off with new shoes, a new car, and, you know, Rolex watch and a diamond we ring, do it. we ain't going to do it. We're going to be like, man, I, I, I ain't ready yet. I ain't ready yet. Rick, talk about that part, man. Talk about... Talk about... <clears throat> what you just said a lot of people won't start if they can't start off at the top they don't want to start off at the bottom with nothing no they can't be they, they, some people can't be humble you know I started off with a t-shirt when I when I you know that's how I fought my way out of homelessness you know and, and, and you know some people say well you were staying in an apartment I was staying in an apartment but I didn't rent the apartment it wasn't rented to me you know Somebody that I knew was managing some apartment buildings. They said, we got a vacant apartment. You can come over here and stay. Don't nobody know. With your kids? 
With my kids, yeah. Yeah. And when we first moved in, that motherfucker was full of fleas. Ate us up the first couple of days. And uh when uh when when I went on the Joe Rogan show and he told me that I needed a t shirt, I was mad at Joe. I was mad when I left his show. <laughs> Why are you mad, Rick? I'm like, this motherfucker, I tell this motherfucker I'm doing bad and, and he tell me I need a t shirt. So what you what you what you thought he was gonna go? Give me some cash. <laughs> Shit. Man, shout Come out on, to man. Joe Rogan, man. Come on, man. Hey, if you got Look, look how I'm looking at myself, right? This is how I'm looking at myself. Check them out, y'all. Yo, this is the dopest podcast ever, man. Share this live. Share this link, man. This is how I'm looking at myself. Big Neff. Big Neff. East Orange of the Blood. This is how I'm looking at myself. Check them out, y'all. Joe, you got the coldest motherfucker in the game sitting in your office. And he tell you he needs some help. This is the coldest motherfucker in the game, right? This is a motherfucker that get in any industry he get in, he going to take that motherfucker over. Just like he doing with the weed right now. He's sitting in your office. He tell you he needs some help. And he told you you need a t-shirt. He told me I need I needed a t-shirt. And he didn't give me a t-shirt. He just told me I needed one. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so so now, tell, tell, so, the story. tell the so, story. Keep telling the story, right? So I'm like, what the fuck? I tell this motherfucker, how am I going to get a t-shirt? I'm broke. You was broke when you did one of the Joe Rogan? Yeah, yeah, I was broke. Man, I ain't have 50 cent. I'm broke. Hit that like button, y'all. Share that like button. Go ahead, Rick. So you broke. So anyway, I leave this, I leave this place. I'm mad, you know. Because uh, I really don't understand the value of the internet at that time. Right. You know, I saw. I watched that interview. Views and all that stuff. Exposure. I don't really, I don't really get that yet. And, and I'm already saying, motherfucker, I've been on Nightline, Dateline, 20, 20, 60 minutes. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know. I don't been on every TV channel it is. Except Oprah Winfrey. She the only one to interview. Why Oprah? Yo, Oprah, send this to Oprah, man. Oprah, interview my man Freeway, man. Do it. She ain't gonna do it. She ain't gonna do it? I know she done got my book. How you she know? She never held my book up. How you know she got your book? She done got my book. She done heard about me. Somebody done told her about that book. Yo, send over my book too, man. Stick and tell me my soul. <laughs> <laughs> she, she don't like people been in jail. Yo, Oprah. And you know, she don't like people been in jail. Oprah, I got two books. Have me on your show. I stopped watching her because she didn't like dudes in jail. You know, one day I was watching her show when I was in prison, and, and she started talking about, oh, you're dating a prisoner. And, and I was like, oh, no, I'm, I'm through with her. Fuck her. All right, so, so Rick, so you mad. He tell you you need a T-shirt. So you leave the show. You pissed off. Now what happens next? Well, one day I'm walking about, about three or four days later. I'm walking down the street. This young dude walk up to me, young white guy, and he's like, hey, Rick, I saw you on the Joe Rogan show. I got a T-shirt idea for you. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Out of the blue. Another one of these T-shirt motherfuckers. I don't think a motherfucker can make no money selling T-shirts. You know what I'm saying? Like, I need some money. I need like $5,000 to go pay first and last month so I can get in me apartment. That's the only thing. You living in a hotel at this point? No, I'm staying in a vacant apartment. In a vacant apartment. Okay. So my man, the little kid, how old was the kid? I don't know how old he was. He was, you know... Just a white dude, you know, middle age, probably thirties, you know. Okay, okay. So Rick, I got an idea. He said I got an idea for a T-shirt. So what happened next? I said, "What's your idea?" You know, I'm thinking he gonna come up with some elaborate shit like the swoosh on Nike or something. You know what I'm saying? This is what I'm hoping for. You know, some crazy swoosh on a Nike T-shirt. Like, oh my goodness, that's a great idea. And then he said, "The real Rick Ross is not a rapper." That's what I said. To yourself? To myself. I didn't never, I wasn't going to disrespect him. Right, 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 right. Obviously, he's a fan of mine. He right, likes right, me. Right. He really liked me. Right. I could tell he liked me. Right. So, he said, man, I'll do everything for you. I'll, I'll do the design, and, and I'll print the t-shirts up. I'll do everything. All you got to do is, when I do it, come down and take a picture. I said, all right, man, I'll do that shit. Let's do it. I ain't got nothing to lose. It don't cost me no money. Let's do it. So we do it. He called me one day. Hey, man, I got the T-shirt ready. It's a couple weeks later, you know. He didn't take no time doing the design and everything. So I go down, and uh, he hands me, after we do the pictures, he hands me 100 T-shirts. On the strength? He just gave me 100 T-shirts. 
The real Rick Ross is not a rapper teacher. I think he made a hundred of them. He didn't ask you for no money? No money. I don't know who, who he is either. You know, I still don't know who this kid is. You still don't know to this day? Oh, I know who he is now. Yeah. He's All one right. of the coldest graphic designers maybe in the world. Okay. So he gave you a hundred shirts on the strip. Just gave them to me. Yeah, man. He showed you that, that design right there? This has been changed a little bit, but the concept was pretty much the same. The real Rick Ross is not a rapper. So he gave me those t-shirts and, and I went out. I sold all those t-shirts the same day. For how much? 20. So you had two grand? Yeah. So I went back to him with two grand. I said, man, I got two grand. I need some more of them joints. He said, okay. And he printed them up. And, and the cold thing goes. He started fucking with crystal meth. So when he started fucking with crystal meth, he said, man, Rick, man, I'm fucked up. I'm on crystal meth, man. I ain't taking care of my business. And he said, yeah, man, here the screens to your shirt. Take the screen to your shirt. And, and I done sold some online. And I'm going to pay you a percentage of that. And, and, and here, just go, man. I'm, I'm through with t-shirts. So I take the screen. And I'm like, what the f I'm going to do with the screen? So I found me another printer. You know, and we start printing them up. I go back to Joe Rogan, and he put the shirt on. So you go back on the Joe Rogan show. Yeah. And give him a shirt, and he wear the shirt. Because I kind of see it now. I kind of understand now, right? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a few thousand dollars in my pocket now. You know what I'm saying? You understand what he was saying now. Now I kind of understand. So I said, well, shit, if I go on Joe Rogan show, and he put the T-shirt on. You called him? Yeah, I called him. That's when he used to answer my telephone calls. So... So uh, uh, he put the T-shirt on. Oh man, that week eighteen thousand dollars hit my PayPal account. Like, the T-shirt sales. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, it was like blow PayPal up. You know what I'm saying? PayPal was like, we gonna hold some of this money. You know? <laughs> it was crazy, and you know the T-shirt never stopped selling. It's still selling today. Not as much as you used to, five, ten a week, you know, but... But that put wind in yourself. <clears throat> oh, that got me started. That's how I was able to put the book together. The order Bible, the street Bible, the ghetto Bible. The ghetto Bible, that's how that was able to be put together. Get his book, man. I read his book. I read that I read that book. That book is awesome, man. Born in Texas. I, the story is dope, man. Well, you know, when I wrote that book, I wrote it for young, young, young people who... Cause, you know, in jail, the young dudes kept coming up to me. Hey, old head. You know, they used to call me old head. <laughs> <laughs> and that time, I wasn't be like 30 years old. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. They called me old head. But, you know, these kids was in there 19, 18 years old. You know how young. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they kept asking me questions. And I was like, well, you know what I better do? I better, uh, I better um, write this book for the ones that I can't talk to. And I also didn't know if I was ever going to get out of prison. At this time, you got a life sentence with no possibility Without of parole. Without possibility of parole. So I didn't know if I was going to ever get out. So the only way I would be able to be relevant to help other people was through this book. So I just put everything that I could think of. I just poured my head out into the book. you know. So really, when, when you read that book, you really getting into my mind the best that I could get into my mind. You know, I, I, I couldn't get it all the way in there, but I, I did the best that I could when I wrote that book. So um, So you wrote that book in prison? Yeah, yeah, that book. You was at Long Park? Oh, you know, I did a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, a little bit at MDC, a little bit at um, Long Park, a little at Victorville, a little at Texarkana, you know, so many different writers. Jimmy DeSaint helped me. Butch helped me, a couple other people helped me, you know, another guy named uh, Carl Most, he helped me. Uh, um, I've had a lot of help. Kwame, Kwame T, he helped me. You know, I sent it out to Kwame to edit it, you know, so so I had a lot of help with the book. You know, I, I don't mind soliciting help. You know, I, I, don't, I don't mind uh, uh, humbling myself and asking somebody. So you don't look at that as a form of weakness when you ask for help? No, I think it's a form of strength. Because most people were so proudful that they won't ask for help. Right, they think it's soft. 
Yeah. And think and, it's weak. And they'd rather be broke and knowledgeless than to have the knowledge and have money. Because if you get the knowledge, you will get some money. Trust me. So, 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 Rick, you write this book. You you win your appeal. <clears throat> you do all the legal research to win your appeal to overturn your oh, life yeah. conviction. I had everything. When, when my when my when my when my new court appointed attorney came on board, I already had all of the the, the law <gasps> already laid out the way I wanted to argue it, the way I thought it should be argued. Uh, I did all that already before he ever. Um, before he ever got on my case. So when he got there, it was already laid out. What I wanted to argue, you know, I let him argue his points, but I argued when him also okay, argue these points as well. But yeah, I, I did all my research. So you get out, now Joe Rogan, you got this 18 grand in your PayPal after Joe Rogan. Well, that, that was just that, that one week. <clears throat> Money kept coming in every day. It didn't stop, but like, I mean, oh, so after he wore the shirt, eighteen grand was in your PayPal like one week. That was just one week, but every day they was ding buying. ding ding ding. So cash we, register ringing. We was in the in that, in that apartment, like folding up t-shirts, like crazy, packing bags. We going to the post office with boxes of t-shirts. I, I got to get another t-shirt to do that. You know, I ain't been able to get another one to do that. So, That's why I always wear this. When people ask me why you always wear the same t-shirt. Because the motherfucker pay me. <laughs> so what about so so you got to get back on Joe Rogan now? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's cool, but not. I mean, I don't really need. I don't really need nothing, really. You know, uh, I'm so I'm so smart in this weed industry that, that if I never sell another book, another T-shirt, you know, none of that really would affect my 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 bottom line, my cash line. So you have a you have a legitimate California cannabis license to retail and grow cannabis. Well, first I won. First I won a dispensary license. I won that with the state. You know, well, how did put you in mean? The lottery, you won, in the lottery. In the lottery. Really? You can get in the lottery, and, and first we fought with the city. We go down fight fight with the city. We get them to agree to let convicted felons get a license. So that was a battle that took three or four years, you know, back and forth, putting off hearings and, you know, standing in front of the podium, hammering on the podium. Yo, you gonna let, you gonna let convicted felons in? You got all these mother that sold weed and, and they didn't go to prison. You gave them a license. How you not gonna get the ones who went in and paid their dues? You know what I'm saying? And paid their debt to society. Why you not gonna get them a license? Cause they got caught. And so we finally got the city to agree. And after that, they decided it was gonna be a lottery. So now I'm allowed to be in the lottery because if they don't say that convicted felons can get a license, you it don't even make no sense in getting in the lottery. Because you get in the lottery, they put your name out the hat and they run your man. Oh, you're a convicted felon. Right, you, right. You disqualified. Right. So the first thing we had to do was get it where convicted felons could get a license. So once we did that, I, I wound up winning the lottery. I came, I came in uh, on the lottery. I came in one ten. Uh, so I still wasn't gonna get a license because they was only giving out a hundred licenses. Mm. So I still was 10, 10 slots from behind. But the way it worked is everybody had to be qualified. You know, once they pick your name, they was gonna go through. Oh, your building ain't right. Your address ain't correct. You didn't fill out your application all the way. Whatever. You know. Oh, you a child molester or you, you, you got violence in your in in, in your in your jack. Whatever would disqualify you. So they disqualified. Uh, 12 people in front of me. I came in 98, 99 on, on the list. Booyah, I got my license. So technically, that made me worth about 5 to $15 million. <clears throat> that just, license? Just that license. On the street, just, just without having doing anything? Without doing anything. I, I probably could sell that license a day for $2 million if I wanted to. You know, I could flip it today. So, but so, so they only gave out a limited number. They didn't. It, they're not gonna right. keep. It's not gonna be no more. Anybody, you can't. No matter how much money you got, you can't just go there and get a license. It don't work like that. You gotta be qualified. You had to be picked out of that slot. So once I get that license, I didn't stop. Um, so the next thing I did is I started my own brand. 
So uh, I came out with the, the LA Kingpin first, with the vape pens, because it was the cheapest to get started. You know, I'm still working, I'm still pimping on a budget. You know, I ain't got no unlimited money, so I'm pimping on a budget. So I start with the vape pens, because they was the cheapest. And I get that going, and, and, and I just keep learning the business, keep learning the business. I'm going to grows, I'm hanging out with the growers, I'm hanging out with the distributors, just, just soaking up game. So while I was doing that, uh, one of my partners, he was like, man, you know, such and such and such and such and them. It's a company that got some public money, you know, a lot of public money, a couple hundred million dollars. And they didn't know what they was doing with the people with me, you know, they were giving people money. And uh, they, uh, they got in trouble with the building. You know, they couldn't afford to, to put it together. So the guy told me, he said, hey, man, you know, it's a building over here. Uh, 44,000 square foot building that uh, the people losing it. I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, how much they, they want? He said, well, to take over the note, just the note every month is 21,000 a month. I was like, oh, I can handle that. I said, um, let me go talk to him. So we go talk to him anyway. We worked the deal out. This building is a 44,000 square foot building and it already had the license attached to it. License came with the building, so um, so I picked that up. So right now I'm in the process of building that out. Um, that's going to be about I think we calculate that to be like 5.7 million dollars every two and a half months. So we do that times five. We can do that five times a year. So we're talking about roughly about 30 million dollars a year in gross revenue. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. So, y'all, man, especially the young dudes, man, a lot of y'all don't want to do the footwork for some reason. I don't know why. I think you guys get so hypnotized by Instagram and YouTube and Snapchat and all, and, and you think that if you can't come out the gate looking like new money, you won't do it, man, and it don't start like that. I mean, y'all y'all know my story already. I got out of federal prison having lost $1.2 in bachelor's degree in accounting, master's in finance, and I couldn't even get a job at Wendy's uh, or Gold's Gym and uh, started a window cleaning business. And my first window was a $3 window. And, uh, you know, from there, here I am, you know, and, um, you know, you were cleaning them windows. It'd be cold as hell. Sometime I'd be in New York, you'd be cleaning them damn windows. I was out there, man. It was 12 months a year. I cleaned windows 12 months a year. It, you know, me and Sean had to have some way to stay. We had to have some milk. We had to have some bread. We had to have some eggs. But the, the point is, and I don't know. I guess it's the drive you got to have that drive inside of you man in the vision to win. yeah you, you got to have a vision <clears throat> man like i guess maybe because i had already lived the lifestyle that i know that i could live and i knew that i got to get back there that's what drove me and that what con continues to drive me what would you think about that rick knowing the money used to handle a million dollars a day five six million dollars a week yeah, I mean that 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 drives me too, and, and it's part of mine is is revenge too. Mm. Check them out. Yeah, part I of can mine, feel that. Part of mine is revenge. Speak and, on that. Um, I, I was in court, right, and, and I was writing my book in prison, and the prosecutor he stood up in court and he had copies of my book. When they came in my cell, they made copies of my book, and he told the judge, he said, "Your Honor, he's over there writing a book." He's going to make money off of this. Assistant U.S. Attorney? Mm-hmm. And when I heard him say that, I was like, man, this motherfucker don't want me to be successful. Even if I'm in prison for the rest of my life, he still want me to be in prison, miserable, unhappy. I said, you know what? I ain't going to be miserable and I ain't going to be unhappy. I'm going to make myself successful from prison. And that's what I did. I started working. And then the shit just became a habit. Like, it feel like my success feel like I'm hitting the prosecutor in the gut. Bam, 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 b
damn, the police, ah, all the naysayers, the haters. And, my man Jesse Katz, he said it the best in the book. If you ever read that magazine, that magazine, I read it. You read that magazine article, and, and super negative, man. <clears throat> he 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 writes it as if like you ain't gonna never hit the street again. Yeah, that's what he thought. That's what he thought. I mean, it looked like that. You know, when when you go to the federal, in the feds, you know, only one percent or half a percent give back a life sentence. Most of the time when you go to the feds and they get you, they got you. You know, they usually don't play. When they give you life, that's what that is. That's, that's what, what that is. That's what that means. You're going to wear it. So, you know, when he when he was writing the article, uh, uh, I didn't take it personal on the article, by the way. Never did I take it personal. But I did say I was going to show him that he called it wrong and that he's going to have to rewrite that article. What about in that article you talked about you was selling hair too? You was you was selling hair. I did that when I first got out of prison. I got up in hair. I got up to hair about I found like seventy thousand dollars worth of hair. And uh, my cousin, who I was working with, my partner, who I brought in the game, who went on parole, was able to go to India and get the hair. Well, one time he got all the money, went to the airport, and never came back. Yeah. Family? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, well, he was in the dope game with me, too. He, he made money with me in the dope game. So. Wow. That's why I was really shocked, because in the dope game, he was always a straight-up dude, you know? Right. And, but I guess the money was so much easier and flowing so much faster than it's easier to. Yeah. So, man, you know... It's not easy, man. It's not easy. Brick, how old are you, man? I'm 61, going on 62. I'm 52. I'm 52, and y'all see how I get down. I upload two, three videos a day, work out every day, take care of myself. Brick, I, a lot of my... Talk about the importance of taking care of yourself, man, the physical fitness, man, and eating. Well, you know, I eat right. One of, one of, one of the parts I really, really hate right now that I don't do is I don't work out like I like I would like to. You know, I was just telling Sean, you know, I'm hitting the jump rope again. I do about 10, 12 minutes on the jump rope. Uh, play a little tennis with my kids, uh, but my days are so crazy. You know, my phone started ringing most mornings about five, and I usually go to sleep most morning, most nights around 12, 12.30. Every now and then I get in the bed at 11 o'clock. Uh, some days I get a nap during the daytime, you know, I'm riding in the car with somebody, I'll fall asleep in the car, but uh, my days are pretty packed, <coughs> and I don't get to work out like I want to, but uh, um, without having help, there's no wealth, you know, you got to be healthy, you know, you got to eat right. I'm a vegan, I don't eat no sugar, no butter, no salt, no animal products at all, um, Still do the French fries every now and then, uh, but I'm working that out of my diet. Uh, and my goal is in the next couple months to get on a real uh, workout program, you know, like I was when I was in the pen. And, and I'm gonna see if I can get back to that to that type of condition. I know it's gonna be hard because what I, what I'm learning now is that as you get older, it's harder to uh, to burn those calories off. You know, I never I never been this old before. You know, so this is a new experience for me to to actually be this old and to to to, to find out that my body is not uh, what my mind thinks that it is. You know, your mind will tell you that you still twenty some years old, but my <laughs> body my body gonna let your ass know, yo motherfucker, you look got older than that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but that that definitely you got to you gotta get on your exercise. Uh, you you especially if you got the time. You know, if you don't have the time, that's one thing. But but we should all be working. You know, one of my one of my teachers told me, do you do you sell time or buy time? You know, there's two people out here, one who buys time and one who sells time. And you have to find out which one you are. Mm. Are you the one that's selling your time or are you the one that's buying time? You know, I want to be the one who's buying time, you know, because time is something that uh, we all running out of. 
What you mean by that, Rick? Buying time and selling time. What you mean? Well, the guy who the guy who sells time, you know, he goes to McDonald's, he punches in the clock, he gets paid fifteen dollars for an hour. I got it. So now he guy, sold his hour for fifteen dollars. Exactly. Now the guy who bought that time, see if the guy mm. if the guy wasn't working for the fifteen dollars, then he would have to be there cooking fries. So he so the guy that bought the fifteen dollar hour is trying to squeeze out fifty dollars an hour out of it to make thirty five dollars on exactly. top of it. Exactly. Yo, <laughs> yo, hey, Rick, why, 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 why you think, man, motherfuckers don't really talk to you? They get you on these shows. They want to harp on the eighties and the crap. Why they don't focus on <clears throat> your mind, your mental, the entrepreneurship they ain't mind? Deep enough. They too. They too shadow. But I see it though, man. Well, you you a different dude though. That's why you did what you did to get to know me. That's why you made the steps. See, you made some steps to get to know me. And had you not made those steps, me and you probably would have never come in contact with each other. So that puts you. On a different path than most people, man. Why would you go all the way to Baltimore, and then you know I'm in Philly, but you could have went back home. You could be at home right now. Yeah. But you drove from home to come here. Drove from Baltimore to Philly to meet up with you. So you could do this interview. But Rick, man, you, you know, I don't know, man. You know, I think I, I kind of know that the stigma that comes with, uh, and and your stigma whether it's real or imagined is probably more imagined than anything is probably worse than mine, but the stigma of being a convicted felon and, but with the, the mind that you have, man, for somebody to really sit down and analyze what it was that you did and you were in your twenties. Yeah, I didn't know anything. You were in your early twenties and you couldn't read, but yet you were able to manage a fortune 500 operation, although it may have not been you know, uh, politically correct. You know, why has it, has Harvard reached out to you, the University of Chicago, Oxford, any of these business schools to say, no, come and come and talk to us as a business school and talk about logistics, talk to us about uh, managing people. You you, Doctor Detail in the building, man. Shout out to Doctor Detail. Thank you for that super chat. Um, you were managing. How many people? You mean you were managing 10, 15 people? Right now, people. I probably got 100 people working with me right now that I don't even pay. I got like 100 people. I got like 100 people that cooperate with me right now. People who answer their telephones for me, they answer emails for me, they do social media stuff for me right now, and I don't even pay them. And they're all happy. And because... I was able to convey my vision to them. I was able to get them to see the vision that I see, that sometimes you have to put the work in first and then the money will come. See, so many times, there we go back again to the person selling time. Now see, when you're selling time, you want to get cashed out right then for your time, like on Friday morning, you know, because they got y'all program to get you, get your check on Friday or every two weeks on Friday. <laughs> Some of y'all get paid on Thursday. I'm just saying, you know, Friday is a normal day, though. Most of y'all get y'all checks on Friday. And some of y'all get y'all checks on the first of the month and the second. Fifteen. You know, but it's still the same scenario. You know, you, you want your check. After you do so many hours, you want your check. But the guy who's buying time... He may have to wait three years before you get a check. Or even four years. I've been out here 12 years and I still didn't get my check yet. I'm still waiting on my check. But I still keep putting in the time to move my momentum forward. And when my check comes, my check might be $30 million, $20 million. So <clears throat> what you got to do is you got to figure out, is it better for you to take $2,000 a month or is it better to wait three years and get $400,000? You got to be the judge. 
Rick, where did you get your people management skills from, man? And your ability to sell your vision and convince others of the vision. Well, the first thing you got to... Is that something that can be developed? Can can the, can the viewers develop that? Or is that something you were born with? Or, or how does that go? Well, you know, my teacher, one of my, one of my teachers, my tennis coaches, he told me that we weren't born with Dan and nothing. We got some, some basic instincts, but... He, he, he did a scenario like this for me when, when I think I might have been like 16 years old when he told me this. He said, if you take a, a baby and you put them in a box and nobody ever tells that baby not to shit on himself, how old would that baby be before he stopped shitting on himself? And I thought about it. I was like, shit. And I sat to think, I said, well, shit, I done seen kids five and six years old still shit on themselves. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's even what their parents tell them. Hey, boy, quit, pop, quit popping it in your pants. So, technically, it could go on to 20, 30 years old that the person is shitting on themselves and nobody ever teach them. So, the things that we do is things that we've been taught. We are accumulation of everything that we've saw, heard, and been around like we've taken pieces from all the people we know good and bad probably in our community mostly bad shit you know that's why there's so many of us that sell dope because dope is so easy to learn how to do in our community everybody sells dope so anybody can teach you how to sell dope but who can teach you how to sell real estate I mean let, let, let's even go there I'm gonna use you for an example Sean how many people in your community can teach you how to go wash windows? None. So that's what we're up against. There's nobody in our community that can teach us the right things to do. So the answer to your question is that no, we weren't born with it and it's, it's learned. It's learned. Some of it purposely. What I do now is I purposely learn the things that I want to know and the things that I don't want to know, I shy away from them. I push them away. What about distractions, Rich? Rick? M mental distractions, people, women, uh, uh, haters. Uh, well, we need haters. <laughs> haters. You, you need haters, haters should be motivational. <laughs> yeah, they, you should motivate them because you know they you don't got, like you got, you got haters, Rick? I'm sure I do. I don't ever see them. <laughs> <laughs> I like them though. I, I've been I've been wanting a hater, you know, to come and, and hate on me. I'd be hoping they get on my on my live and, and heckle me and <laughs> talk nasty to me. Well, wow, Rick, it it motivates me. Excuse me, man. It motivates me. It make me go even harder. Oh, you don't like? Oh, you don't like to see me with all this money, motherfucker? I'm gonna stack another ten thousand on that motherfucker. See how you like that? Go stick yourself. I'm gonna treat him like Stick yourself, Tony. Stick yourself, Tony. <laughs> Stick yourself, Tony. <laughs> Stick yourself, you mad? Tony. Now you mad? You still mad, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We need haters, but you know, for the most part, you you you, you gotta be the one to 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 focus your way of thinking on, on what it is that, that, that you want to accomplish. Because believe me, there's plenty of people out here that has dedicated themselves to uh, uh, doing the same thing that you want to do. And even if you got a brilliant idea. You gotta get it fast because sooner or later somebody else is gonna come up with that same idea. So focus is is, is very very important, and, and um, we all need to be focused. You know, we all need to know. But in order to be focused, though, you gotta know what you want. You know, most people you ask them, what is it that you want? Who know? You A lot know. of money. Yeah. Money. What you gonna do to get it? I don't know. You got some skills. People come to me all the time, man, Rick, I need a job. Well, what you do? Uh, I can do anything. Anything like what? I don't do anything. You know, I got specific things that I do. You know what I'm saying? Now, what, what skills do you have that can fit in with what I do? And then if you don't know what I do, it's the first thing you do, if, if you're going to go ask somebody for a job, first thing you should do is study them. Then you know what they do. So then when you go to them, you say, man, well, I know you do books. And you need somebody to carry the books outside the car every time you get out the car. Oh, I need you. Come on, man. 
How you know I need? That's what I need. I've been needing that. But you, you, we go to our people and we don't even know what, what they do. But we want some money. So really what you want is not a job. You just want some money. Welfare is what they call it. Last question. I'm going to let Rick go, man. Hey, Rick, man, I always ask this question, man. Is Freeway Rick's life already written by a supreme being and higher power and there's nothing he could do to change his fate? Or is Rick the author, the architect, and the director of his life and he gets to make his life what he wants it to be with his choices and his decisions? Yeah, I believe that I am the orchestra of my, of my, of my life. Uh, I, I look at myself now, you know, when, when, when I used to look back, I was like, wow, I wish I would have did this. Well, what I do now is anything I wish I would have did yesterday, then I do it today. And if it's something that I want to accomplish, then I start working toward those goals. Uh, we can mold ourselves to be whatever it is that we want to be. It's really up to you how, how you take yourself and, and mold yourself. You know, what I tell my, my people when they come to me and ask me questions, I say, what you should do is you should let yourself dream your wildest dreams. And then once you do that dreaming, then you should set out to try to make those dreams come true. And that's basically how I start my life off, my days, you know, I'm I'm doing things that I never thought I could do. You know, movies. You know, I have my documentaries on Netflix for a year and a half. Number one documentary for a year and a half on Netflix. Uh, I was the feature story in Esquire magazine's 80th anniversary. I mean, over Obama, over Clinton, Dr. Dre, all of them was in the magazine, but they said that my story was was the number one story. So, so, and I'm not doing that to brag, but I'm just telling you that when you set out to mold yourself to be that that you want to be, then you've satisfied the hunger in you. You know, it, it's sad when people, um, when they die and their dreams die with them. You know, they never... Uh, one of my teachers said the graveyard is the richest place on, on, on the planet because so many people die with their dreams. You know, million dollar dreams, billion dollar dreams die and went to the graveyard. So don't you be one of those who allow your dreams to die and never come to life. Rick, on that note, man, we, we want the movie, man. We want the biopic, epic, silver screen movie. I want to go in Jersey, in the IMAX theater with the Dolby surround sound at the AMC theater. And I want to see your movie on the screen, man. I And I don't want you, I'm 52, you, 50, you 60, 61, you getting up there, you know. I don't want your movie to come out after you in here. I want you to be, have creative control over what I see on that screen. When is the movie coming, man? It's coming. It's coming. We got it. We got Reginald Hudson working on it, Kim Hardy, uh, Gino Taylor. Uh, I got a nice crew working on it. And this time, I'm going to be able to get some money out of it. And I'm going to get to go to a set. Not like those other guys. They told me that they may let me come on the set or they may not. You know, doing it this way, I'm going to get to go on the set, which is what I really wanted. You know, I wanted to be able to oversee and make sure that, uh, but you guys get the real story and not another cartoon. Somebody offered they offered you eight hundred thousand for your for your movie, right? For your yeah, story. They did, but they told me I might not be able to come on the set. Offered him eight hundred thousand, but he couldn't come on the set and would you, you turn it down? Of course. I don't love money. I just like making money. <laughs> it's a difference. It's a difference. See, some of y'all y'all love money. Y'all do anything for money. Some of y'all that sell your body. I, mean, I used to do a lot of stuff for money. You know, I sold dope. And shot at a few people behind it. And, you know, but not no more. Because I learned that there's things in life that's more valuable than money. Yo, Freeway Rick Ross. 
Sean G. The podcast was sold. Rick, I appreciate you, man. No, you my man. Um, we're going to let my man get some sleep. It's late. We in Philly. Shout out to everybody in Philadelphia. Uh, make sure y'all share this uh, share this link. Go on. Rick, tell them about your your, your streaming channel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah YouTube yeah, yeah, channel, finest. Instagram, everything, the shirts, everything you got. Let them know where they can get it from. Well, Jan- I mean, June the 19th, we're going to be fighting in Atlanta, Georgia. Not fear Charles, Kid Austin. It's going to be live, stream live on freeway.live. That's my channel, freeway.live. Freeway.live. So go check it out. Uh, all y'all should join my millionaire club. I'm going to make 250 people millionaires. Hopefully you one of them. You probably won't be, though. Most of y'all don't listen. I bet y'all ain't even read Sean's book. Y'all come holler at him every day, but you don't read his book. But that's on y'all. You're missing out. And you probably ain't going to listen to me. And buy my book and join Millionaire Club and do all the other things that you should be doing. But if you don't, it's on you. Peace. And for y'all who are smart enough to take action and then read the book and then follow the instructions. Where they can get your book from, Rick? FreewayRickyRoss.com. FreewayRickyRoss.com. Freeway.live. FreewayRicky on Instagram. That's everything, right? Uh, what about the T-shirts? Freeway Ricky Ross on uh, on Facebook. Freeway Ricky Ross on Facebook. They, they can get shirts and hoodies. Shirts is on the same. They on the same site. You're gonna be able to find all that, man. Support Rick, man. Black American hero. Shout out to y'all. Peace. Peace. I'm gone.